Hi, I'm Dr. Dan Ratner. Today I'm joined once again by Dr. Arlene Feinblatt, the chief psychologist who worked right alongside Dr. Sarno throughout their work together over the years. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, hit like if you like what you're hearing, and put your comments below and I'll get back to you personally. And finally, you can reserve your place in one of my seminars or purchase any of my PDFs at www.crushingdoubt.org. Arlene, I really am so excited to have you back. Uh, I, I keep thinking about our, our discussion last time, and it was such an honor to get to hear about the work you did with Sarno and all these things I learned that I, I had no idea about. So thank you for coming back. So what I wanted to talk... I mean, I have lots of things I want to talk to you about, but um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is your relationship with Dr. Sarno. I, I, I think people, uh, the feedback I got is people are just so fascinated by that, that, that dynamic, what it, what it was like. So can you, you, you said in the last time we met that, you know, to have someone learning along with you in this process right. was such a, such a wonderful thing to have, but he also was a pretty remarkable person as are you. And so I'm wondering what, what was it like to work that closely with um, you? It, it was a very unique relationship. Um, it was colleague, collegial, but it was it was it was unique. I, I, I can't even find the words for it. Um, yeah, we were both exploring. We were exploring from coming to each from our own experience. Him as a physician, me as a psychologist, and. One thing about John Sarno was that he was very respectful of people's knowledge. He he was never, you know, some physicians uh, get anxious when they think you know too much. He was never like that. He he wanted you to learn. He wanted you to know. He he encouraged that. And certainly at that time. The two of us were embarking on something that, for both of us, um, was very different uh, in terms of the people around us. I mean, he he had difficulty being accepted by other physicians because I'm sure a big portion of it was their own threat to their own psyche and their own egos and their own pocketbooks. Um, for me, I had a lot of feedback on, should I be doing this? Uh, these patients could deteriorate. Uh, and they really, um, a lot of my colleagues didn't understand what I was doing. Um, they thought it was sort of mumbo jumbo. Um, a lot of them had their own chronic pain problems and couldn't see any. I mean, these are psychologists, but couldn't see any psychology connected to it. It, it was very difficult, but we did have each other and we had the interns that I brought in um, to learn who were always, very, we were all very respectful of one another because we were all learning at the same time. So, I, I mean, I would speak to Dr. Sarno, and I never called him John. I mean, I worked with him for 40 years. I never called him John. To me, he was always Dr. Sarno. And um, we would speak frequently during the day. I mean, if he had a thought or I had a thought, we would think nothing of calling one another and say, oh, I just had an interesting session with XYZ and this came up. What do you think about that? I mean, it was it was very unique. That's yeah. all I can say. Yeah, but you're you know you're you're hitting on something that I think was important in in the interaction, and I give you both a lot of credit for this. But this is something. Can I'm you speak of. any louder? Because yeah, I'm, sure, sure. Thanks. Um, you're hitting on something that I think is really important about who I think Dr. Sarno is two people and I felt this when I read his books he wants you to be powerful he doesn't he's not holding you at arm's length he's right. not and that's what he was like with you yes yes he was very much I mean 
I would never have said to him, do you think maybe this person has um, some sort of medical uh, underlying symptom here? That, that I knew enough not to say because that would be the one thing that would throw him um, in terms of understanding what we were up against here. You really had to have a very forceful person who was saying, look at the ideology of this. This is not physical, this is emotional. And, um, but uh, aside from arguing with him about his basic premise, which I never would have done, I totally believed what he was saying and what we were doing. Uh, there wasn't much she could say to Dr. Sorno that would throw him, you know. Um, he was a very sharp reader of people, um, whether it was an intern whose work he was a little critical of, or it was a patient who came in and, he's, and he would call me and say, this one's going to be tough. Um, but he was always right. I mean, he wasn't off the mark. And I used to wonder at his ability to read people so well, but he did. And when he felt you were working hard, whether you were a therapist or a patient, he, w he would do anything to help you do that work. I mean, he was just a unique person. He's a hero to so many of us. And I was thinking, um, you know, th this podcast is called Crushing Doubt. And one of the main parts right. of what I work with is that we need some certainty. And the thing, right. there's so many things I love about Dr. Sarno, but he was so certain. Absolutely. And he was. He was. And, and that's what you needed. You needed. That's why we say when people are saying questions like, well, is good to this be? TMS, could this be psychological, whatever? You need that. You need that backing. You need somebody saying to you, absolutely, look at this. Yep. And um, he, he was always very sure of what he was doing. Um, and in the beginning, when we started developing these ideas, you know, uh, about the goodism and, and the problems people had with anger, and um, the childhood traumas that people went into. He was always, um, he picked up on these ideas and ran with them. I mean, it was just, it was a pleasure to say to him, you know, I think all of these patients really have this problem with asserting themselves. Um, uh, fighting with the people that they loved. I mean, this was the, this was the start. It wasn't, it wasn't that we started out with the idea, oh, rage is such a big topic for these patients or childhood trauma. We, sort, we were just feeling our way. And fortunately, amazingly, we did all right, even from the beginning. I mean, when these severely disabled people who were, who were coming into the hospital on the gurneys and, and, and in wheelchairs, we did extremely well, despite not having all of this in our back pocket, so to speak. Yeah, but you know, I, I think one of the reasons you did well right from the start is because you were being scientists. You, you, were, you were open. You know, you don't have to right. have the answers. Yeah, that's it. You have to be open. And, and I, you don't... I, I was just saying to somebody the other day, the minute you think you know the answer, that's your downfall. <laughs> you just, you don't know. I mean, the patient will tell you when you're right. Right. But you, you don't know. And if you go into um, a setup with a patient thinking you know the answer, this could be very problematic. One of the things I wanted to talk about was um, rage, anger, because um, a lot of the reading that I have done 
focuses on this idea that having anger is such a terrible thing. Right. And the thing that Dr. Sorno and I really tried to work on with people was that anger is an emotion. It's not good or bad. It's an emotion. What you do with your anger is a different story. And so anger gets this very bad rap or rage gets this very bad rap. But it, the emotion is just an emotion. And the more you can learn how to deal with it in a positive way, the less of a problem it be, you know, it, 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 there's less of it to work on you. I totally agree. Actually, what I was thinking, Arlene, is that anger not only is not problematic, but in some ways it's necessary. You know, the, Absolutely. The, Absolutely. The, the achievements of the world happen because of anger. In fact, I don't know what you think about this, but in watching Sarno in all the rage and just reading about him, I think one of the reasons that he was able to be so certain, the, one of the re reasons he was able to take on this fight was that he was angry in a, in a good mm -hmm. way. You know, yeah, where he was like, yeah. I mean, he, he wasn't an angry man. No, I no, mean, no. He didn't walk around with it. No, a whole but bunch I mean, of anger. but he, he, go he ahead. tolerated it. He loved, he learned how to tolerate it. Right. And when you can tolerate it yourself, your patients learn to tolerate it. But I think he was angry on behalf of the sufferers. Oh, yes. And that, See, that's channeling anger, and I, I mean, I don't know if you agree, but that's thats how it strikes me. And you guys did su such remarkable things, and I, I'm just, I'm thinking about the combination of you two and how great it was because he brought this certainty and strength, but I think you, you and you may have had that too. I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you about that, but I know one thing you brought just from listening to you is that you kept questioning and and that's science right there. Keep open to it. I know he was like that too. So you guys had that. Did you have the certainty that he had? Or did it rub off um, over time? Or what was that like? Well, I had the certainty that I could help people. Mm -hmm. um, did I always, was I always absolutely sure when somebody walked into my office that they were suffering from a psychosomatic disorder? No, I'm not a physician. I can't. I can't gauge that, but I had Dr. Sarno to rely on. And when patients would come in and start, uh, I'll use an, uh, an easy word, uh, arguing. Well, I don't know that this is, um, I'd say, look, I'm not here to argue with you. If you don't believe this, you need to see Dr. Sarno. You need to call him. You need to have a conversation with him. And he would, he would, take care of it immediately. I mean, there was, I never had that problem with patients because I was so lucky to have him that it, it, the doubt was never an issue in, in the therapy. Right. Well, that, and that's great. And I think I learned that from reading him, you know, that in, you know, because I'm, I work just me. So I have to I have to kind of do both sides a little bit, even though from a medical standpoint, I have to rely on people being cleared by medical doctors and, and seen by medical right. doctors. Um, but I do have to bring that, that certainty of the diagnosis. I have to work on the doubt side and, and the other side. But I learned uh, from you even if you, <laughs> But let's say even if you're not sure about a diagnosis, the person has a problem. Mm-hmm. You're there to help them with the problem, whatever that problem is. Right. If, and if they have doubt and uncertainty, it is going to affect the length of time they're going to be in therapy to get rid of this. That's for sure. If you have a physician you work with, they can address these needs. If you don't, um, I, I, I would never argue with a patient about something that's outside my sphere of expertise, which is diagnosis. I, I, I can't diagnose. I wouldn't even begin to try. I can say, whatever the cause of this is, let's try to work on the idea that if, you're, if you become more com comfortable with your emotions, that's going to help regardless. Makes a and lot of sense. I think that's all, as a therapist, we can do. 
Well, you have a beautiful way of sitting with people, you know, and, and that's that's very clear. You're, you're not forcing anything on them, but you're, you're there to help. No. I, I mean, from the very start with John Sorno, I never, you know, the issue of how many patients do I have? And, well, am I going to make the rent this, this month? That was never an issue for me. There, there have always been more patients than I have capacity for. Right. So if somebody wants to argue with me about the diagnosis, I would say, you know, you need to talk to the doctor. If that doesn't convince you, I mean, why are you here? I mean, it's mm -hmm. there. Why are you here? Most of the time this was answered by, well, Dr. Sorno told me to come. OK, so if he told you to jump off a bridge, would you do that? No. So there must be some reason that you that inside yourself that you're here. And let's work with that part. I love I love the way you handled that because it turns it back to them. It is their issue. Right, and it's up to them to decide. Absolutely. Do I want to do this or not? That's why when when I started doing the work, I, I didn't worry so much about is this a TMS or what because very quickly I could hone in on something where we could tie in. And that's what you need to do as a TMS therapist. You need to tie in one event or one uh, anecdote of their chronic whatever, their chronic pain, wherever it is, or their chronic uh, other symptom with something that went on in their lives. The first time you do that, that's it. It blows the whole thing up and, and you never have to worry about, um, do they believe this? Uh, right, because they have the proof right within them. They have the that proof. one thing. Yep. Right. It was like the man said he was waiting in the dentist's office and he had to wait an hour and a half. You know, and the pain was excruciating and it became more and more excruciating the longer he waited. And then he realized what was going on. I mean, that was one of my very first patients. Hmm. Um, and he and he could see that the angrier he got and the help, more helpless he felt and the more frustrated he felt and the more um, frightened he felt, the worse the pain got. And he could see it. And yeah. so from then on, it was smooth sailing with well, let's look at other times when this goes on. That and that first pairing is so crucial. And I wanted to ask Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you. You 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 did a lot of group work. Um, yes. And was that the main modality that you came to about it? I actually don't know. Um, I I, yeah. I mean, I I did it at first because <laughs> I couldn't handle all the workload. So I said, well, let's do groups first of all. It, it was very helpful because, as I told you, they would tattle on one another. And um, you know, because they were living together, you have to remember this was an inpatient thing. Right. And if I had eight patients, I, I couldn't see I, I couldn't see eight patients each day, every day. It, right. it would have been impossible. So I brought in group and, and it was a very um, fortunate uh, step that I took uh, and it was very apparent from the get-go that this would be helpful I mean I didn't have to spend much time thinking is this group a good idea um, they they ran with it and then when we had outpatients when we started the outpatient which is what most people are doing who are you know who are doing this work they're not working with inpatients they're working with outpatients the groups became a, a very important adjunct to the work. Well, and you did such a great job, clearly, with letting the people be powerful themselves. They had they had influence on each other. They they absolutely it, the group itself was helpful. In fact, you said you gathered some data right on these groups. I wondered if you could talk about that. Yeah, and I presented it as I said. I presented it at Psych American Psychosomatic Society. I presented it at APA. Um, and what we found was that patients became less 
repressed and more open and their pain decreased significantly. And because, you know, the beginning is getting them, getting them into this mode of thinking, getting the patient into, okay, I got to start looking at what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some of them used to come in and say, how are you feeling? Because they knew every, every other sentence is, how does that make you feel? Or how does it feel when somebody says this? Um, once you've gotten over that hump, that initial hump, you have to start tying things together. You can't just wait for some extraordinary event to take place and then to see it. You have to really work at it. And ISTDB was much more helpful in that regard because it was um, with you know, short-term dynamic, you, you 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 work this triangle of present, past, um, and anxiety, and it's certainly easy enough to do that once they're committed to the process. Yeah, and the, and the short-term aspect is kind of freeing uh, because you've got to dig in. You, you you just don't have time. And actually, it made me it was making me think about a particular thing. I don't actually remember where where I read this. I think it was in one of Sarno's books. One of the things that was most convincing to me about Sarno's works was how well he described my personality. And I'm not just talking about goodism. There was a particular thing he described that blew my mind. And um, I think that, I, I think he said something about how you dealt with this kind of thing. So I wanted to talk about it. And that was <clears throat> when I was suffering and telling someone about it, I would smile. Oh God, I, I couldn't. Dead giveaway. Right, and I couldn't, and I hated that smile because I knew that it wasn't aligned with me, but I didn't understand it. I, th I just thought there was something wrong with me. And, and, t and, and the funny thing is I actually basically don't do it anymore now that I understand these things and I'm, I'm more aligned with myself. But when I was reading Sarno and he described that, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe anybody knows about it. I just thought it was a me problem. So that was something you experienced And it's interesting because the smiling and the laughing are there two there were two major um forces driving that which is one i don't i don't want to think seriously about this too seriously i don't want to take this all in and two how are you going to feel how is the person you're telling this to going to feel and i have to reassure them oh it's not so terrible well you know, it's pretty terrible. Yeah, right. It's it's taking care of the other person in a in this taking care of way. the other person, or take and or and taking self. care of yourself, and it's to your detriment. But it's it's the first easy step to me, working with someone. First, are they connecting with me? And there are all ways you can check that out. And secondly, are they being true to what they're saying? Are they working with what they're saying right it's all it's almost like are they actually listening to what they are saying saying exactly. or are they instead paying more attention how will this be perceived how and, will it be received and how and also you know the, the, a lot of people come from uh, environments in which it's not well perceived right so they're trying to protect themselves in some way from your going oh my god or oh, yeah. so what uh, I, I think you'll agree with this, Arlene, but you let me know. I I, I do tend to see the, the, the good in people, and I tend to see that they make sense. But um, the thing that I was thinking about is that I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about who people are. Right. And so when they're doing something like that, I don't assume something negative. I assume there's some reason for it, they, and, and there certainly was for me. I hadn't had people to listen to me fully accurately. So when I would tell people these things, I didn't expect to be heard. And so the the smile was in part bracing myself for something I knew. It was like a knowing smile, not a happy one. 
but it was a knowing smile. I knew the, the danger. And I wondered if, if you could talk about when you would see that, that smile or the laughter, when, when things wouldn't add up, how did you interface with the people? I, I faced it directly, the way a good short-termer should do, which is you're smiling and you're telling me your dog died. Is it funny? Is it amusing? What's behind this smile? Can we can we look at this? Did you notice that earlier you told me you had a, a bad episode of pain and you smiled then too? What's this smiling all about? I, I, I never wait. I never yeah. wait. If a, if a patient's not looking at me, he's not facing me, I never let that go. I mean, certainly in the beginning. It ne- if I've been working with someone for six months, I don't, I don't bother with that anymore. They're, they're connected. I'm not worried. But in the beginning, that smiling, that not, you know, look all around the room while they tell you something, which is the same, it, it serves the same purpose. Oh, uh, my dog died yesterday. Uh, they don't want to look you in the eye and tell you that because then they're going to have to deal with that emotion. You're Whereas helping. If I'm looking at something else, I can distract myself. But you just helped me understand something. See, I'm always learning, and when I when I heard what you just said, I now understood something, which is that's actually about connection. I mean, I was kind of saying that anyway, but right. it's all about the anxiety of: am are we going to connect? Is it safe to connect? Yes. Yes. Are you, that was yes. brilliant. I right? think that's true of teaching too. If you're afraid of your students, you can't teach them. I agree. If you're afraid of your patients or their symptoms, you can't work with them. Send them to somebody who won't be afraid. Send them to somebody who can be present with their pain, emotional, physical, whatever. I I love that you said that, and it's making me think of the one time I did speak to Dr. Sarno. I don't re- I don't remember if I said this to you in the first time we met, but um. When I was trying to get better and I had gone to see Eric Sherman for a little bit and then I was like, I got to go straight to the source. I got to talk to Dr. Sarn. He was 91 at the time. And I left a message for him. He was only checking messages and getting back to people every two weeks. But I got to talk to him and it was only for two minutes. And at first what he said didn't feel that helpful to me. But it it, it was like, and this was, I think, kind of classically, classic Dr. Sarno. What he said became more and more helpful over time. <laughs> and here's what he said. I, I told him my story and he was like, he literally said, well, why don't you work on it? And I thought to myself, what? This isn't giving me why anything. Don't you why don't you work on it? Work he, just, on it. he just said, why don't you work on it? Yeah. And I said to myself, I don't know how that's going to help me. But as I thought about it, he was trusting me. Right. He, he was saying, listen, you have the information you need. He was also trusting the information. You have the information you need. Now just work on it. You'll get there. Right. It, it was a right. confident. I heard it later as confidence in me. Yes. Yes. Whereas yes. I was looking for, give me something. Give me, yeah. And um, instead. And yeah, and the whole goal is to tell the person you have it within yourself. You have the power. You have the control. Um, absolutely, and he and he did this instinctively. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't something he had to learn. He just he was that way. I, I was sick once, and I wound up in the ER. And he came in, and he was. I mean, he was the most warm, caring person in the world, and I was. I wasn't used to being in that role with him, you know, and it was like, whoa, that's nice. That's really nice. <laughs> this is what people are talking about. <laughs> you got yeah. to experience it yourself. Yeah. I wanted to ask about a couple of other things um, because I deal with chronicity versus acute symptoms. Mm-hmm. And I wondered, you know, in the short term work, maybe there's not that important of a distinction but did you come over time to see chronic chronic symptoms versus acute symptoms as things you had to deal with in different ways or was it kind of the same model no i 
no, I'm the same me always. Um, no, I mean, the only time I would see an acute symptom was, was, was always really funny for me because they would come in and say, oh, I had such a bad attack. I don't know why we have to talk about this, what, what was going on. And and my pain was so bad. And, and what I would re later on say to them is, I didn't know it got better. You know, now you see it, but it's been getting better and you've never reported that. Now, suddenly you have a new episode, an acute episode. And I said, oh, I forgot how bad it was. But patients don't always tell you when it's getting better. Because if you're doing the therapy right, it's not an, it doesn't become the issue that you're talking about, the symptom. It, it, it goes into the background and you're talking about their behavior and what's going on and how they feel. And, and so the only way you know <laughs> that they did get better sometimes is when they have an acute attack. They right. said, oh, I forgot how bad it was. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. And, and they, uh, I think they sometimes think we just know, which in some ways right. is a good sign because it's like we're really in the journey with them and, right. and they can right. feel it. Arlene, I wanted to ask you about how both you and Sarno saw trainees and where you wanted the field to go because you guys created something. And then you knew right. you had to hand it off in some way to continue the uh, learning. Well, I, I trained a whole bunch of, of interns, um, all of whom might be one or two exceptions. I have total, total confidence in. And if people ask me for a referral, um, I tend to, you know, go with those people because I know their work. One of the things that was unique for me was that when I had an intern, they were always in group with me. So I got mm. to see their work. Yeah, right. Um, you know, a surgeon learns to do surgery by observing. In therapy, you don't always learn by observing because it's a one-on-one -on -one process. But in the group, I could watch them work and they could watch me work and so um, that kind of training is vital. You, you know, uh, also with short-term dynamic was the, the training was with a camera on you and a camera on the patient and then a, a group watching the, the proceedings. And that was how you learn to do therapy. If you're learning it from even the greatest note taker in the world, you're not getting it. Even if you're getting it on a tape, you're not, you don't see the patient. So um, the mm. group was a wonderful opportunity to train people. And I would urge anybody who's trying to train people, do a group and do it together. And you'll be amazed at how much both of you get out. I, I, I so agree. And Arlene, I'm, a, I'm actually training some people in my methods. And the interesting thing is when I'm training them, the time I see them make the biggest leap is when we're actually doing it. You know, I'll say to them, okay, well, let's, let's look at an emotional issue that you're trying to figure out. And we take them through it. And by doing it, it's totally different. So you, right. you passed it on to these people. And, and um, we do have to stop in a moment, Arlene, but I wanted to say... You impacted so many people. I th I'm sure you know that. You don't it's need me to tell you that. You. Well, but I, it's it may be kind, but it's also very true. Thank you. Um, Thank you, you, you are a real treasure, and Thank you. I'm here partly because of you. That's not so nice of you to say. Really, very complimentary. But um, I loved what I did. And I love teaching and I love watching other people. And it's just a joy for me. And I think when you have someone you're working with and it's a joy for them, that spills over. Well, thank you for sharing your joy 
with all the patients you, you, you did and all of the supervisees. And thank you for sharing uh, who Dr. Sarno was because not many people have that that close a viewpoint that you got. And um, I'm honored you were here with me and I, I appreciate well, thank it. Thank you very much. Let's keep thank in touch. You. Okay. All right. Thanks, Arlene. Take care. You too. It's always such a pleasure to spend time with Arlene and I'm blown away by her wisdom, but also what she achieved. And to hear directly about what Dr. Sarno was like in, in his interactions with her, how remarkable a duo they were, I'm just so grateful that we had them. And uh, we hit on a lot of different things. And and it's hard for me to even sum up, especially because I've done another interview with her, so it's, I, I, it kind of blends together. But I think that her trust in her patients certainly echoes something that I have in working with mine, that I think we have to trust people to get somewhere. And that's, that's one thing I wanted to make sure to highlight about this interview. It was a pleasure speaking with her, and I'm grateful that she spent time with me. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, hit like if you like what you're hearing, and put your comments below, and I'll get back to you personally.